Welcome church, I'm so glad you're here. Over the next five weeks, we have six messages. Yeah, you heard me right. We have six messages because we have Good Friday. We have been observing the season of Lent as a church. Lent is the journey to the cross, to observe and to consider the journey that Jesus was on, and also to prepare our minds and our hearts for Good Friday and Easter. In this series on the cross, it's meant to challenge us to consider the cross from different perspectives. As we work together through this series, my prayer is that you will be challenged and encouraged, which will in turn change the way you see and the way you work in the world around you. Today, we'll be looking at the perspective that Jesus' actions on the cross bring us equity. The gift of salvation that Jesus brings to each of us freely by his death on the cross, it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter where we've been, it doesn't matter what we've done, it's freely given. And I mean, and we see this clearly in, in, in the book of John. I mean, it's one of the famous, if not the famous uh, verse in, in the Bible. And it's John 3.16, and I want to read it for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This truth that God sent his son on earth to die on the cross for everyone is not just found in John, but Paul also picks this up in Romans. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As we consider together... It is such a powerful truth that God sees each and every person and does not reserve the gift of salvation only for some or a select few, but offers it to all who believe in him. I don't want to just stop here. I want us to consider what this truth means for us and how we see and treat each other. Before we get into that, let's just pray. God, I ask that you would move in these words, God, that people would see the truth from your scripture, that we would be impacted today. God, that we would know and sense that because of the cross and at the foot of the cross, we have equality. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Jesus' time leading up to the cross, he is with his disciples. He is taking and talking with them, and he gives them a new commandment. This is found in John 13, 34, and 35. Let me read it for you. A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus instructed his followers to do unto one another as he had done for them. This was an extraordinarily per personal for the men seated around that table. See, when we read it, we hear, as, as I loved you, we think of the cross. But for those that were sitting around that table in that moment, they were hearing it in context to the three years that they've spent with Jesus in ministry. I wonder if each person in the room would have been transported back to a particular moment in time when Jesus had loved them particularly well. He would have looked at each one of them in the eye and reminded them of a time when he loved them. He may have looked at Matthew and said something like this, Matthew, remember what you were doing when the first time I met you? Matthew would have replied, yes, Jesus, I was working for, for the Romans, to, uh, collecting taxes. I was, well, um, I guess I was a bit of a thief. Good people kept their distance from me. Remember what I said to you that afternoon, Jesus would have said? Matthew would have replied, yes, Jesus, you invited me to follow you. 
No rabbi had ever done that. Jesus would have said, exactly. Matthew, extend the grace to everyone you meet for the rest of your life as I have loved you. Jesus would have worked his way around that table one by one, talking to them about that moment, that time when he deeply loved them. Extending that same grace and that forgiveness, I extend to you, everybody, to everybody you meet. Just think about that moment for a minute. That would have been incredible. Little did his disciples know that the only in a short time he would display the ultimate act of forgiveness and love on the cross. But Jesus continues, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This term, this, is a demonstrative pronoun. Remember those? I certainly did not. I had to look it up and kind of figure this all out again. Demonstrative pronouns are used to point to something, something specific. In this particular case, it's a singular demonstrative pronoun. Jesus pointed to one specific thing that was to be identified, identifying characteristic of his followers, the way they loved. This new command was to serve as the unifying and defining characteristic of his new movement, the church. His new command was to serve as the governing ethic. The standard against all the behavior was to be measured for those who called him Lord. His primary concern was not that they believed something. He insisted that they do something. They were to love as he loved. The men gathered that night as uh, had an inkling as to what this might look like. In a short time, it would become very clear on the cross. Jesus didn't connect his new commandment to the anchor all religious commands were traditionally connected to. Love for, fear of, dedicated to God. Jesus connected his new commandment to himself. The measure being a true follower of Jesus was, was not a ritualistic or a day of the week or a festival calendar or a sacrificial worship. It, was invisible. it wasn't to some invisible and somewhat distant God. Following Jesus would not be about looking for ways to get closer to God who dwelled out there or up there or somewhere. Jesus' followers would demonstrate their devotion to God by putting the person next to them in front of them. Authentic Jesus' followers would, uh, wouldn't um, authenticate their love uh, for God by looking up. They would authenticate their devotion by looking around. But it didn't stop there. Absent from Jesus' new command was an overt reference to his divine right to require some allegiance or obedience. In this command, Jesus refused to, to play the God card. Even in his final exchange, Jesus did not use his holiness, his personal uh, righteousness, or even his uh, d divine grand moral authority. Jesus points to his example how he loved. Jesus' love for them in, in the room rather than his authority over them in the room is what he used to instruct and inspire them. The people in that room would not see him seated on a Jewish throne. They would see him hanging from a Roman cross. It was his glory and, and, and gritty sacrifice, not a keep your hands clean holiness that compelled his disciples to eventually take up their own cross and follow him. If you're a Christian, 
That should make you consider your thoughts and your actions. A few years later, Paul would consider this as he wrote to the Philippians. Philippians 5, 2, verses 5 through 11. It says this, In relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus never played the God card. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Not just any death, a death no human would willingly subject themselves to, even death on a cross. Jesus did not use his equality with God to stir his followers into action. He pointed to his love. Jesus didn't anchor his new command to his divine right as king. He he anchored it into the sacrificial love. Why would his disciples, why should his disciples obey his command to love? Because he loved them first. He loved them best. They were to do unto others as Jesus had already done. And was about to do unto them. A short time later, Jesus uh, staged the ultimate demonstration of love. That not only took their breath away, it took all the excuses away as well, along with ours. Jesus used selfless love to compel his followers towards love. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus' new all-encompassing command was far less complicated than the prevailing system of rituals and sacrifices. But it was far more demanding. There were no more loopholes, no workarounds in this brand of love. What does that mean for me and you? if we call ourselves Christians, to love like this? Do those around you know Jesus by your love for those around you? When I stop to consider this, I can feel like a total fraud. I can feel like a failure. The only thing for me to do in that moment is for me to come back to the cross and surrender, to receive his love, to see the ultimate example, to be reminded of all the times that God has extended his love for me when I least deserve it. There's a beautiful link in this command, and it's it's that love should not only be given, but love should be received. I want you to consider this as as we think about the people around us. As we think about, you know, standing at the cross and, and that we are equal as we stand there. There is no position of power. There is no uh, what you have. It's not about race. It's equal. And that love that, that we've received, and as we give that out, that, there's a beautiful exchange that happens between those that, that love him. That we give that love and that we receive that love. Now, as I've been thinking about, like, what does that actually look like? And as I wrap up today, uh, it really is embedded in, in Paul's words again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And, and many of us know this. I mean, this is the love chapter but when, I, want, I want to challenge you this week. Would you take some time this week to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13? But not just read it from a perspective of, of love that, that we try to give, but what would it look like if not only do we give that kind of love, how Paul describes it, but that we also are open to receive that kind of love? When we're in that that beautiful exchange of, of give and receive, people will know us as followers of Jesus.
Let me read for you again from John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. For this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This week, as we consider the equality of the cross, that everyone has that opportunity to take that and receive that free gift. Would you consider what it means to, to, to be loved by God? Would you also consider what it means for that beautiful exchange to happen? To not only give love, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 13, but also to be open to receive. It levels a playing field. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you that, that we could pause and think on this, on this commandment. And I ask today uh, that you would move this in the hearts and the minds of each and every person that has heard. We trust, Lord, that you are at work and that you will allow us to be known by our love. And you will allow us, Lord, to receive that love from you and from others. I ask this in your name. Amen.